from Casablanca, Morocco's frenetic commercial hub. Morocco is often hailed for its stability, its position as a regional leader in women's rights, and for having a rich cultural history, but it's still a largely male-dominated society. I've always made the films I wanted to make, written the stories I wanted to write, and shot them the way I felt like I wanted to do so. Being a female rapper is an exception, and I would love that someday to not be the exception. Je m'impose, je suis libre, je fais ce que j'ai envie de faire. Je ne pense pas que je permettrai à quelqu'un de m'arrêter parce que je suis une femme. We're here to meet three women making space for themselves in film, fashion and rap music. We're starting with rapper Huda Abuz, a.k.a. Tell us about your artist's name. What does it mean? My artist's name actually means your sister. I was like, OK, I need something smart, provocative and catchy. Rappers used to this is each other using the, the word which is your sister. I did to your sister. Actually, to prove that uh, your sister can rap, she can be independent. She can force herself in a scene that's usually uh, very manly. In a rap scene dominated by men, women's voices are making waves. Kutek sings about gender equality and LGBTQI rights. Her plan is to do a PhD in gender studies. Mental illness is also a big topic for her. I'm bipolar, so in 2016 I, uh, I, I, got, I got into a mental uh, institute, the psych ward, but, and when I went out, I was like, I was writing about, writing lyrics, and I made some friends listen, they were like, it's awesome. So after that, when I started uh, taking meds, uh, working a little bit more of, on my mental health, I, uh, I kept on writing, 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 and it kept going and going until now. How big is the rap scene here in Morocco? It's as big as it can get. Now, the most important uh, genre, musical genre, is rap. Everyone listens to rap, and it's everywhere. And there are there lots of female rappers in Morocco? And female rappers were, were always present in the scene since always, since hip-hop started. But uh, I think before me arriving to the scene and other artists, it was like uh, women were always in their place. You had rap and female rap. But now I think it's mixing, it's the same thing. I, I am in features with all the male, male rappers and I am with them because I'm a female rapper, because I can rap. The Moroccan rap scene is very inclusive. Katek flew to fame in 2020 when she collaborated with three Moroccan rap stars, El Grande Toto, Don Big and Dragunov. Their video has been viewed 34 million times on YouTube. So this is Cartel Vibes. I record a lot of my songs here. And most of uh, the Moroccan rappers, they record their projects, uh, EPs, albums. So it's kind of the QG of uh, Moroccan rappers. This is my G. This is my friend, Cartman. Hello. Hello. How are you? Nice you to good? meet you. Good. How are you? Yes. Cartman, he produced my first song, Kickoff. You used to record in my uh, room. Yeah. And we didn't have any material, any recording stuff, so we used only to improvise. Well, let's have a listen to it. Yeah, let's okay. do that. Let's do the Ahuda. Let's do the Ahuda. <laughs> I would say uh, kickoff is about everything that was frustrating in my life love, uh, the system, uh, misogyny, uh, uh, depression, everything related to it. So, yeah, it was like uh, an explosion. Huda is one of uh, the most intelligent people I know. 
she made her uh, her place uh, very quickly and uh, she got a lot of respect very quickly. So to be sincere, I want to be in that speech of, uh, I am a victim, I am a woman, they wanted to kill me, no, it was easy. Do you feel free to sing about whatever you want, and deal with any, talk about any subjects that you want? Now I think I have a lot of responsibility and I have a lot of impact, so I can't say anything that comes to my mind. Freedom of, spe of speech in Morocco is it's something uh, blurry that we don't know, it's one way or, or another. It's you, you want to go, you want to say whatever comes to your mind and you want to pay for it and maybe someday even leave the country because you can't live here anymore because you are in an eternal war with the system or you just want to stay here, make music, make impact with your words in a very smart and implicit way and I am choosing the, the, the second path because I, I love Morocco. <laughs> Morocco's hip-hop scene was showcased back in 2021 at the Cannes Film Festival with Nabil Ayush's Casablanca Beats. It was co-written by his wife, Mariam Tuzani, also one of Morocco's leading directors. They regularly work together on projects that talk about taboos in Moroccan society, like prostitution in Much Loved, and homosexuality in Mariam's latest film, The Blue Kaftan. Mariam, you filmed part of your new movie here. Tell us where we are. We're in the Medina of Casablanca, and it's uh, one of the most inspiring places I know. You live here in Casablanca. It's not as well known as other cities like Fez or Marrakech. And describe the city, people who don't know it. Casablanca is a city that's uh, vibrant, that's, uh, that's big, that can be uh, a little bit overwhelming, but at the same time that is just really, really authentic and that has a very particular energy to it. It's a city that's full of contrasts and Emotionally, it's just a, a roller coaster. It's, it's wonderful. And Morocco is often considered as one of the regional leaders when it comes to women's rights. And what's your experience like? My experience as a woman in Morocco has always been very positive. I've never felt that I had a difficulty in doing things because I was a woman. I never felt that as a filmmaker I had a, I had a hard time because I was a woman either. Your work as a director, as a filmmaker, as a screenwriter, as an actress is acclaimed around the world. How is it received here? Because some of the subjects you deal with are quite taboo. I feel uh, very strongly that there is a real desire for debate, that there is a real desire to talk about things that we don't necessarily talk about. And sometimes when a film comes speaking about this kind of subjects that it opened, opened a, a window uh, for discussion, that's something that's very, um, very uh, beautiful f as a filmmaker to feel that it can contribute to, to a positive debate. Blue Kaftan is a beautiful film. Um, homosexuality is one of the themes of the movie. Why did you want to tell this story? I wanted to talk above all about love. I wanted to talk about love and the freedom to love. The freedom to love who you want to love in the way you want to love them, regardless of where you live in the world. The love between these three beings, Halim, Mina and Yusuf. And also the love of a craft, a craft that's, uh, that's disappearing today, that of traditional handmade kaftans. It's part of our, of our DNA, our, of our history, and uh, the fact that it's uh, just being uh, forgotten. Uh, because there is no more place for it in the modern world, here is something that, that hurts me and that I also want to talk about. You decided to set this film about challenging old ideas in a place that is very traditional, very historic, a Medina, which is in the centre of most Moroccan cities. Why did you decide this place? There is something beautiful about tradition. There are certain traditions that are part of who we are, but there are also some traditions that I believe have to be shaken, have to be questioned, and that is also what I wanted to do. And I really do believe that both things can cohabit, the old ways and the new ways. 
I think there is place for both. You talked about um, the traditional dress, the kaftan. Um, can women in Morocco wear what they want? Because I know while you were filming um, one of your parts in Razia, you actually got insulted for wearing tight clothes and short dresses in the street. Um, are women free to wear what they want here in Morocco? Morocco is a very, uh, very diverse and very com complex country. And you can find spaces of freedom everywhere. And you can find the opposite everywhere as well. A little up the coast from Casablanca is the ancient port city of Saleh. From here hails designer Fadila El Gadi. With a clientele of Saudi and Moroccan princesses, she's also dressed notable women such as Palomo Picasso, Barbara Streisand, Beyonce and Hillary Clinton. Wow, this is incredible. It's incredible. Yes, it's pretty. The jacket that can be worn with trousers, black jeans, and you can wear it in the evening under a cape or a long skirt. It makes a really nice outfit right away. How does Morocco inspire your work? I was inspired by women working in embroidery and weaving and by the Medina in Saleh, which is well known for its crafts. And the architecture, everything in Morocco inspires me. Who are your customers? They come from all over, Africa, the United States, the Middle East, and now a lot are from Morocco. A person who loved Morocco very much and who's known for his role in the emancipation of women is Yves Saint Laurent. Tell us how he influenced you. Saint Laurent is my mentor. I met him in 1999. He was one of the first fashion designers to use Moroccan craftsmanship. We have the same sensitivity. I'm obsessed with sensitivity and by the need for clothing to be comfortable and to give confidence to women and their beauty. In Morocco, less than a quarter of the workforce are women, compared to half in France. And around 15% of Moroccan businesses have female bosses. In Fadila's workshop, her artisan embroiderers are hard at work. I don't see myself as a businesswoman. I'm a craftswoman. My way of working is to impose myself. I'm free. I do what I want. I don't think I would let anyone stop me because I'm a woman. I've been doing embroidery since I was a child. When I started working here, I saw that Fadilla was imagining new patterns that were really aesthetically pleasing. I really enjoy working with her. It's important to preserve our craftsmanship, our traditional way of sewing, making knots and cutting. Welcome to my embroidery school in Sally. Fadila's lasting legacy may be the free school she opened in 2016, teaching underprivileged children the dying art of embroidery. We call this a second chance school for young girls and boys who are either failing at school or who have never been to school. The idea is to teach them the skill of embroidery. We have a girl here among the students who has now become a teacher in turn. This is Rabati embroidery. 
I come from the countryside. I came from there to this school and spent three years here learning lots of things. We are trying to preserve our heritage and culture, which are under threat. We're working with glitter right now. I'm teaching Amin to tie the knot. I mean, do as I taught you so that we can see it properly. As you can see, embroidery is at the heart of what we do here. There are also other courses available. I have my breakfast here when I come in in the morning. And then we work. For example, on sewing technique, beading, Rabat embroidery and Fassi embroidery. In the afternoons, we have classes in French, maths, drawing, computer science, and Arabic. I dream of becoming a famous embroiderer one day. Women in Morocco decide things, they take things in hand. I believe Morocco can only progress with its women. Three female pioneers, using their art to protect and celebrate their heritage, while at the same time creating constructive conversations about subjects sometimes considered sensitive in their kingdom.